Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the virtual classroom. Uh, this class, this lecture, is in American government, Political Science 100. That's the class that you are hopefully registered in. Uh, two things before I begin my lecture that you must do. Uh, number one, you must read the syllabus. And number two, uh, view the orientation lecture, the introduction lecture that I made last week. So it will orient you to how we will conduct the class. All right. Uh, another thing that is uh, a must is you download the review sheets from Canvas, print them out, or save them in a file, and then work on them and answer every category so you can study the lectures and the notes and everything in between, and that will prep you for success when you take your exam. All right, uh, as you can see on our uh, lecture video, the outline split screen between me on the video and the outline on the right. So we begin with uh, basic definitions. This class is a class about politics. So the first thing that we need to define is what we mean by politics. Had we been in an actual classroom, I would solicit your uh, impressions on what politics is. And uh, most of the time, students give me negative views on politics. Uh, I don't blame them, uh, given what has happened in the United States, not only in the past four years, but basically I would date it back since the 1970s. Okay? So, let's begin by the definitions of politics. That is uh, point A on the outline number one. Write it down. Politics is a process that allows individuals to secure something that they value. Okay, that is the most commonly used definition. Process that allows you to secure something that you value. For example, Americans value having a good standard of living. They value having a decent home, they value having decent income, they value having decent education, they value having, uh, you know, decent infrastructure, you know, the good things in life. So how do you achieve those legally? We're not talking illegal here. How do you achieve what you value legally? Write it down. The best way to achieve what you value in the United States legally is to acquire higher education. Get as many degrees as you can, a bachelor degree, a master's degree, a PhD, without getting yourself into debt. And that's the tricky part. 
That is the tricky part. Because in the United States, education is considered a privilege, not a right. And therefore, it costs a lot to get an education. After health care, the cost of education has far outpaced inflation. So two things that are very expensive in America, health care and education. If you get more degrees, more than likely you will have higher income and that will allow you to achieve what you value. Okay? Let me show you the data on this. If you go to my website and uh, you would look at unemployment rates and earnings by educational attainment, that uh, chart to my right, and we interact with it, it will show you unemployment rates and earning by educational attainment 2019. This data is taken from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, so it is as official as it gets. So let's interact with it, shall we? All right, so what do we see here? What do we see? Uh, look at the green bars, the green bars. It will show you the following. Someone that has a high school degree, their weekly median earning, how much they earn per week, is median $746, $746. By contrast, someone who has a professional degree or an advanced degree, will earn in excess of $1,800 per week. So, it proves our hypothesis that the more income you have, sorry, the more degrees you have, the higher your income will be, right? When you have a high school degree, your income is low, when you have a professional degree, your income is high. When you have a master's degree, your income is high. When you have a bachelor degree, your income is high. All right? Also, if you look at the unemployment numbers here, the blue bars on the left, you will notice that if you have a professional degree or a doctoral degree, you are far less likely to be unemployed. The unemployment rate for somebody with a PhD or a professional degree is 1.6% or less. Whereas people who have less than a high school degree, the unemployment rate is 5.4%. So you ask yourself, where would you rather be? I would rather be here at the very top, okay? Is this clear? Do you understand this? All right. So that is one definition of politics. It is a process to help you secure something that you value. And I gave you an example of that. The second definition of politics Number two, on our outline, <clears throat> politics is the peaceful resolution of conflict. Peaceful resolution of conflict. When politics becomes violent, we call it war. Okay? Peaceful resolution of conflict is politics. Um, an example with that, you are having a disagreement with uh, your roommate. 
okay? Over cleaning the house, over paying the rent, over contributing to the groceries, etc., etc. As long as you and your roommate are negoti negotiating a resolution to your conflict, you are practicing politics. However, when you reach out and you smack your roommate, you hit him or her, then you have crossed the realm of politics into the realm of war. Do you understand? Excellent. Third definition of politics. Write it down. Politics is the competition between interest groups pursuing their self-interest. Competition between interest groups pursuing their self-interest. In other words, politics is selfish. Politics has winners and losers. Those who have wealth and power are usually the winners. And those who do not are usually the losers. If you ever wondered why policies coming out of Congress, laws that are made by Congress, almost most of the time favor the rich and the powerful, it is because the rich and the powerful have interest groups that lobby Congress on their behalf. Whereas the poor and the weak do not have strong interest groups that represent them. Okay? So politics is competition between interest groups pursuing their self-interest. Final definition that we are going to mention Politics in the USA at the federal level, politics in the USA at the federal level, is about the federal government allocating resources to government programs. Now, what resources are we talking about? Of course, we are talking about taxes. So, the federal government taxes the citizens of the various states. It takes the money <clears throat> to Washington, D.C., and then Congress allocates that money into federal government programs as Congress sees fit. So, the question becomes, where does the federal government allocate the close to $4 trillion in spending that it acquires partially through taxation? Let's take a look about government allocation of tax resources. Okay, so this is uh, taken from the Congressional Budget Office, and it shows you the breakdown of where the money is spent and where the money comes from. So let's interact with it. And by the way, all this data is available on my website. You can go get it from there if you want to study it some more. So let's interact with it. Here we go. Pull it up. 
Let's go up. All right. So revenue. Back in 2019, the federal government revenue was $3.5 trillion. All right. Uh, most of it comes from the individual income tax, $1.7 trillion. If you notice, the corporate income tax is very, very small. See that, like $230 billion and shrinking. The payroll tax is what is paid for Social Security and Medicare. That is taken also in part from your paycheck. So there is individual income tax, and then there is payroll tax. All right. Uh, let's look at spending. Where does the federal government spend the most? So write it down. We have four major areas of spending, four of them. Number one, Social Security. Social Security, what is it? Social Security is a federal government program where the current working population pay for the retirement of those who are not working those who have retired, those who have reached the age of 64, 65, and went into retirement, okay? That's Social Security. Largest part. The second large part is Medicare, which is healthcare for the elderly, and Medicaid, which is healthcare for the poor. So the federal government spends the second largest amount of money is on health care, right? So biggest part is Social Security. Second part is health care. Sometimes one is higher than the other. Sometimes they are tied, but they are the largest section. Third part that the federal government spends on defense, okay? $676 billion, now it's $750 billion, so it keeps growing, spending on defense, okay? That's the third part, defense. And finally, finally, uh, another big part of federal government spending is $375 billion that the federal government spends on Interest on the debt, the U.S. debt is, I believe, around ooh, 25 to $28 trillion. I lost track of the number. It's a huge number. And every year, the federal government pays interest on the debt. Uh, 2019, $375 billion. Of course, there is the other non-defense spending, which is bigger, and the other category, which is also bigger. But the biggest areas, the three biggest areas, Social Security, health care, defense spending. Uh, that's why some people say, uh, jokingly, of course, that the United States federal government is an insurance company with an army, okay? Because the Social Security is insurance for your retirement. Medicare and Medicaid is insurance for your health. Okay? Got it? Is this clear? Do you understand this? Uh, next definition is um, what is government? What is government? That's a definition. For the purpose of this class, when I say government, I mean the following. Write it down. I mean the federal institutions where politics happens. Federal institutions where politics happens. And that includes the presidency, Congress, the judiciary, the federal bureaucracy, and the military. These five institutions uh, in our class, we will use the shorthand government to refer to them. 
Uh, the second question is this that we need to ask. Is government necessary? Is government necessary? Had we been in the classroom and I had you as an audience, I would have asked you if government is necessary. And some of you would have said, uh, yes, it's necessary. Without uh, a government, we will have anarchy. Uh, we will have evil people doing evil things. And some of you would have said, no, it's not necessary. Human beings can get along without a government telling them what to do and what not to do. All right, write it down. The necessity of government is in large part based on how we view human nature. How we view human nature. If we view humans as evil, as incapable of cooperating, as lawbreakers, okay, as irrational, then the answer to the question is, yes, government is necessary. However, if we view humans as cooperative, rational, altruistic, kind, then we believe that government is not necessary. Unfortunately, the majority of people are of the first opinion, which makes government necessary, which leads us to point A under role of government, number two. Write it down. Government is ultimately an instrument of coercion. That's your book's definition. Instrument of coercion. Coercion means use of force. An instrument of force. Government is the only institution that can legitimately use force against you. Government can kill you and get away with it. All right? Um, in the United States, we have the data that proves that overwhelmingly, most of the time, Overwhelmingly, police officers, who are the instrument of government, kill people of color and get away with it. We know that governments, the police officers, kill people of color at a higher proportion than their percentage of the population. And 95% of the time, the police officers are not prosecuted by the district attorney of wherever the city, the incident happened. Okay? So government can kill you and get away with it. Government executes people and gets away with it. Government sends people into the military to fight wars and kill other people and get away with it. Only the government has a legitimate control of the use of force. 
Is this clear? So, B. Governments make laws that are backed with the legitimate use of force. Make laws that are backed with the legitimate use of force. In other words, if laws are not backed by a legitimate use of force, more than likely you will not obey them. If the ticket for running a red light, for running a red light is small, let's say $10, more than likely you will run the red light but the ticket for running the red light is five hundred dollars or more and therefore you stop at the red light because the ticket is backed by a legitimate use of force it's backed by a police officer by the court system Clear? So that's B. C. Governments, plural, all of them, including the United States, spend on defense to protect the land from an attack by another government and to engage in acts of aggression against other governments. Okay? In 2019, the world spent 1.9 trillion dollars on defense 1.9 trillion dollars on the military the united states in 2020 spent on defense seven hundred and fifty billion dollars seven hundred and fifty which accounts to somewhere around 38 to 40 percent of the global spending okay let me show you Uh, this is a website, again, link is on my website, called CIPRI, okay? And they publish data on global spending. Let's interact with it. Okay. Here we go. So it tells us that global military expenditure is estimated to be 1.917 billion, which is 1.9 trillion. Uh, and if you look at the numbers uh, across the world, it has been going up, right? Uh, it ebbs and flows, but it's always the trajectory is upwards, okay? Uh, uh, when the Cold War ended, it went down, and then when 9-11 uh, happened, uh, then spending started going up across the world in terms of expenditure. So, uh, the biggest spender, United States, uh, China, uh, India, Russia, Saudi Arabia. In fact, 
to equal the U.S. spending, to equal the spending of the U.S. here, you can look at it, to equal the spending of the U.S., which is like 38% of the world's total in 2019, you have to add 10 countries after the United States to equal the United States. China, India, Russia, Saudi Arabia, France, Germany, United Kingdom, Japan, South Korea, Brazil, Italy. And then you have to add all these 10 in order to equal how much the United States spends. So the United States is the largest spender on the military. Not only that, the United States is the largest exporter of military equipment to the world. So we come to the next item on our outline. As you can see, public goods, right? What are public goods? Write it down. Public goods are government services, government services, that everyone uses, but the private sector does not provide because there isn't a profit in it, okay? So it's a government service that we all enjoy, but the private sector does not provide because there is no profit. So... If we were in a classroom, I would ask you for examples. But since we aren't, I will give you the examples. Uh, number one, parks. Public parks are public goods. Uh, during this pandemic, uh, I am enjoying the fact that the state and local governments are providing us with uh, public goods like public parks and uh, trails so I can go and exercise and walk and hike and ride my bicycle. If you are doing that too, you should be thankful for public goods. Okay? So, parks, uh, highways. Highways are provided for by our taxes, and each and every one of us can enjoy them. Uh, national parks, Yosemite, as an example. Public libraries. Public libraries are also an example of public goods. And finally, last but not least, uh, clean air and clean water are also examples of public goods. Each and every one of us enjoys clean air and clean water. And uh, when a government forces a corporation that is polluting the air and polluting the water to clean its mess, that is a public good. Next point is public schools. Public schools. Now, some of you might think that public schools are public goods. Uh, no, they are not, simply because public schools, uh, simply because, sorry, private schools are very profitable. Uh, you know, look at uh, colleges and universities that are private. They are very profitable. Look at, at the private uh, K through 12 schools, very profitable. So we cannot consider uh, schools to be a public good. However, write it down. Almost every government in the world runs a public school system here in the United States, in K-12 
Canada, in Mexico, in Europe, there are public school systems. So you ask yourself, why? Why are governments running public school systems? Well, off the top of my head, I can think of two reasons. Number one, number one, uh, if we go back to the beginning of this class, remember I told you the definition of politics or getting something that you valued, and I gave you an example how more education makes you more revenue. Aha. Right again. Yeah. The more educated you are, the more degrees you have, the more income that you make. And the more income that you make, the more taxes that you pay. Because taxation in America is progressive. The more income that you make, the more taxes that you pay. So governments have a vested interest in helping you get educated. Because getting educated gets you a better job. And when you have a better job, you make more revenue. And when you make more revenue, you pay more taxes. So that's one. Second and more important than the first one, though, is that public schools, public schools are designed to socialize the youth, socialize you into the values that are predominant in a society. Public schools are designed to make citizens believe that the government is benevolent, the government is caring, the government is of them and for them through that institution known as democracy. Public schools are meant to socialize you into a willingness to pay your taxes and into a willingness to join the military because there is no draft in America, into a willingness to join the military so that you can be sent by the government to do its bidding overseas. You know, um, since before 9-11, since 1989, the United States has been fighting wars overseas. In fact, if you really think about it, some of you were not born. Some of you were not born when that has happened. In fact, when you think about it, some of you have not had one day of peace in your entire lifetime because the U.S. federal government keeps sending military and troops overseas to fight wars. Whether it was the war in Iraq, whether it was the war in Afghanistan, whether it was the invasion of Panama in 1989, whether it was the invasion of Grenada, I can go through the whole litany of wars that the United States has been involved in since the 1950s. Okay? All of that requires socializing the youth to accepting the fact that government is benevolent, government is caring, pay your taxes, join the military, etc., etc., etc. Now, is this clear? This is known as, in the literature, Political socialization. Political socialization. 
which brings us to point F, taxes. Write it down. To pay for uh, the military, to pay for social security and health care, to pay for public goods, governments, plural, collect taxes, collect taxes. Here's the question. Are taxes in the United States higher or lower than taxes in similarly advanced countries? Similarly advanced countries are the countries in Europe, uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan. These are similarly advanced countries. So we ask the question, are taxes higher here in the United States or lower here in the United States than other countries? Let's look at the data and what it tells us. Uh, <clears throat> this is a chart. Uh, this is a very common metric measure called taxes as a percentage of GDP. Now, what does that mean? Let me explain for you. Uh, GDP is gross domestic product. It is what a country uh, produces uh, every year in terms of goods and services that are sold on the market. So GDP, gross domestic product. Uh, the question is, what percentage of taxes are consumed from the GDP in every country? So it is a measure that will allow us to compare countries. So let's look. Uh, Denmark at 46.2% of GDP. Taxes are very high in Denmark. So 46.2% of the GDP is consumed in taxes. By contrast, the United States is the lowest. 25.6% of GDP is consumed by taxes. Now, you got to ask the question, yes, we pay less taxes. But what do we get in return? We get less too. In Denmark, you get free health care. They have a national health care service. In Denmark, you get free education, including college. Okay? Same for Sweden. Same for Belgium. Same for France. Same for Finland. In fact, all of these countries have a national health care service. We do not. Our health care is tied to our job. If we lose our job, we lose our health care. Okay? Uh, so the United States has the lowest taxes as a percentage of GDP, whereas Denmark, Sweden, Belgium, France, and practically every other country has the highest taxes as a percentage of GDP. So... The answer to the question, are taxes in the United States lower than higher than other similarly advanced countries? The answer is lower. The United States <clears throat> is still a tax bargain compared to other countries. Is this clear? All right. Uh, the next uh, definition that we are going to talk about, all right, is the definition of power. What is power? Uh, 
power is the ability of one person or an institution to get another person or an institution to do what they otherwise would not do. That is the definition of power. Let me give you an example. On November 2020, Uh, Trump, President, former President Trump, lost the election to now President Biden. Okay? Uh, Trump did not accept the results and erroneously believed that there was cheating and there was massive fraud. <clears throat> he tried to convince the courts to go along with him. The courts said no. In more than 60 cases, the courts said, you haven't presented any evidence beyond hearsay and innuendo. He tried to convince the leaders of states that were run by Republicans and that were won by Biden to overthrow the results of the elections you know, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan. But the leaders of the state said, nope, we're not going to do it. We don't believe you that there was massive fraud. He tried to convince his uh, vice president, Vice President Pence, and by extension Congress to throw out the results of uh, these states that I have mentioned in order for him to win the Electoral College. And Mike Pence said no. Eventually, he didn't get his way. You probably heard about the rebellion that he incited and the storming of Congress by his supporters. In other words, he did not have the power to get anyone else to go along with what he wanted. Power is the ability of a person or an institution to get another person or institution to do what they otherwise would not do. America's institutions refused to go along with what Trump wanted. And now Trump is a private citizen in Florida and there is a president, new president, President Biden. That is the definition of power and the best example that I can give you. Point D is legitimacy. What is legitimacy? Write it down. People obey for two reasons. Okay? Number one, they obey out of fear. You stop at a red light because you are concerned that if you run the red light, you'll get a ticket 
you get into a car accident, your insurance would go up, your license will be suspended. So fear. Fear is a great motivator for obedience. Number two, people believe that the rules and the laws that they are obeying are good for them and are influenced by them. We believe because we believe things are legitimate. In other words, let's bring it back to the definition of power again and the example that I use. Institutions and people refused to go along with what Trump wanted because they believed that Biden's election was legitimate. It was conducted based on the rules enshrined in the federal constitution. You understand? Legitimacy is important for obedience. People obey when they believe rules and laws are there to protect their best interest and are influenced by them through the democratic process. Is this clear? And then this leads us to the last definition before we stop. The definition of democracy. So, final definition. What do we mean by democracy? All right. When I use democracy in this classroom, I mean representative democracy, i.e. republic, okay? I do not mean direct democracy. So, whenever I use the term democracy, I'm referencing representative democracy. So we ask a question, what makes a country a representative democracy? Four items, four items should be present so we can call a country a representative democracy. Number one, write it down. All the adult citizens have the right to vote. All the adult citizens have the right to vote. Now, sometimes in some states, convicted felons lose the right to vote. But then when they serve their conviction, they regain the right to vote. Okay, I understand that. But generally, all the adult citizens have the right to vote in a democracy. That's number one. Number two, elections are competitive. Elections are competitive, meaning there is more than one candidate running for office. More than one. If it is only one candidate, that is not a democracy. Okay? Number three. In a democracy, elections are held regularly. Once every two years. Once every four years 
once every six years, once every eight years. Usually, the cutoff point is 10 years. You cannot hold an election once every 25 years and call yourself a democracy. There should be voters holding you accountable once every X amount of years. And finally, number four, a democracy must have a freedom of expression. Voters and candidates alike must be allowed to express themselves freely without fear of government coercion. Okay? Freedom of expression is also essential for democracy. So, if I gave you an assignment and I told you, based on these four criteria, go out into the field and find me what countries are democracy, what countries aren't. You will be able to. For example, was the U.S. a democracy in 1850? No, it wasn't. Because not all adult citizens had the right to vote. Was the U.S. a democracy in 1915? No, because women couldn't vote. There were restrictions on African-American voting in some states. Okay? Was the U.S. a democracy in 1950? No, because there were restrictions on voting in some states. You had the Jim Crow laws, you had the grandfather clause, you had the literacy tests, you had the poll tax. All of these were restrictions on voting. Is the U.S. a democracy today? Yes. All adult citizens have the right to vote. Elections are competitive. Elections are held regularly, and voters and candidates have freedom of expression. Okay? Is this clear? So, one last item before I let you go. The publication known as The Economist, very prestigious and very well known, uh, publishes the Democracy Index, all right? Uh, and it ranks countries in terms of democracy. They have their own criteria, not like our criteria, but they have their own criteria. I encourage you to go and read the Democracy Index that they have. And they rank countries in terms of full democracies if they score between 8 and 10. Flawed democracies is if they score between 6 and 8. And then uh, uh, hybrid and then authoritarian regimes. Since uh, 2016, and it had nothing to do with the election of Trump, trust me. Since 2016... The uh, Economist Intelligence Unit has ranked the United States as a flawed democracy. See it here, light green, right under Canada. Canada, dark green, it's a full democracy. Uh, the United States is a flawed democracy. Now, as a flawed democracy, uh, in terms of democratic landscape, where does the United States stand among the other countries that are similar to it? So let me show you. Democracy Index overall score and rank, right? And they have the criteria, electoral uh, process, 
uh, functioning of government, political participation, political culture, civil liberties. They have their own criteria. Uh, and then they rank number one, Norway. Number two, Iceland. Sweden, New Zealand, Finland, Ireland, Denmark. Notice the United States is not there. Canada, Australia, Switzerland, uh, Netherlands, Luxembourg, Germany, United Kingdom. Uruguay, a third world country, is ahead of the United States in terms of democracy. Uh, Austria, Spain, Mauritius, uh, Ireland, Costa Rica, another third world country, uh, France, Chile, third world country, Portugal, uh, South Korea, Japan, and then the United States. So in terms of democracy, the United States, according to the Economist Intelligence Unit, is ranked number 25. Okay? Is this clear? Good. So uh, we have reached the uh, one hour limit in terms of lecture. And I will stop here. Uh, there will be another lecture, as I said, two lectures per week. Uh, again, what I ask you to do, get the book, start reading, print the review sheets, start working on the review sheets so you can prep for your exam. And uh, on this note, I will say bye-bye. <laughs>